Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Ryan Dietzenbach with CPM. I'm chairing this morning's session at the 2021 AOCS Annual Meeting and Expo. Our subject uh, matter today is industry updates. We have thought leaders from Metronome, CPM, Ross Camp Champion, Eco Extract, Schrodinger, Foss North America, and Clarion presenting and highlighting processing and quality control initiative innovations for edible oils and biodiesel production. We'll have presentations include detection of organophosphate pesticides, optimization of flaking mill performance on the prep side, more sustainable oil extraction, removal of contaminants, and will be followed by a discussion panel. Our first presenter this morning is We You. WEU is a product manager responsible for the MISA and SERS product lines at Metronome. Metrome, excuse me. We holds a PhD in biomedical engineering from the University of Maryland in College Park, Maryland. We and the team at Metrome Ramen have decades of experience in the manufacture of ramen instrumentation and development of practical applications for ramen spectroscopy and SERS. With that, I'll turn it over to Wee U. Hello everyone, I'm Wei from Metrome. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to tell you about our new exciting uh, surface enhanced ramen or SERS analyzer, the MISA. So this is the outline of my presentation. Uh, I'm gonna go over briefly about the problems that we currently face with edible oils, namely with adulteration and contamination. Uh, I will then give you a highlight of the features of the MISA testing pl platform and how it can it be applied to combat these problems. And then also show you a couple of examples of how we can use the MISA to detect some organophosphate in extra virgin olive oil. So olive oils, Actually, virgin olive oil is one of the most popular edible oils uh, because of the widely promoted benefits of a Mediterranean diet. Whereas 100 years ago, it might be just a farmer using a very crude mill to process oils from his orchard for a local market. With the increase in demand, there is increase in um, pesticide use and increasing the potential for contamination, whether it's accidental or intentional, and fraud at every stage along the, the supply chain. The same can be said for many other edible oils. Contamination of edible oils and other foods is a global problem costing billions of dollars annually. And it is especially prevalent in countries where regulations are lax or where testing capabilities are limited. So it's not only a monetary cost, but there is also a public health issue as well. So in terms of adulteration, adulteration is really a criminal act in the, with the intention to profit from the high value of the oil. If you go to the supermarket today, a bottle of uh, a liter, let's say, of generic vegetable oil will cost probably a couple of dollars. 
but a bottle of good olive oil is going to cost upwards of $10 or more. Criminals take advantage of this by intentionally mislabeling the, a cheaper oil as olive oil or mix cheaper oils with virgin oils to, to add bulk. Sometimes colorings and flavorings can also be added to make the product more appealing. Contamination, on the other hand, is the introduction of foreign material during the production process. Some materials like pesticides, even though they may be re relatively uh, at low concentrations, maybe PPM levels, uh, can still be very harmful for our health. So in terms of testing approaches, testing met methodologies can be classified as targeted tests or non-targeted tests. Non-targeted tests try to determine whether a sample is different from a reference, but this means that the whatever the adulterant or contaminant present must be significant enough that it cause a difference from the reference. Targeted tests are those that aim to identify and if possible quantify the amount of the contaminant that is present. In the current technology testing landscape, there are a wide variety of different instruments and techniques Use depending on the parameter of interest. Most of these instruments that, that I've shown here below are fairly bulky, expensive, and are limited to a well-equipped uh, well testing lab. So this is the MISA from Metro. Metro has introduced the MISA analyzer with the goal of solving these problems by providing a highly sensitive and low cost mobile testing platform. It runs on a rechargeable battery and is the size of a brick. So it's definitely very, very portable. And it can be operated using a mobile device uh, like a cell phone or a tablet. Uh, or a laptop. It can do both targeted testing and non-targeted testing. It comes with a couple of different types of attachments. There is the, um, the vial attachment that um, allows you to measure liquid samples. And there's also a test strips attachment that allows you to perform measurements using a test strip. The way this instrument works is based on a technique called Raman spectroscopy. And for those of you who don't know what Raman spectroscopy is, um, so here's a quick overview. Um, when you shine light at a molecule, light will be scattered elastically, in which case it's called Rayleigh scattering or inelastically, in which case it is called Raman scattering. Raman scattering is a type of scattering where the energy of the scattered photons is different from the original energy of your light source. And the scattered energy can be higher or lower depending on the energy state of the molecule. The different chemical bonds in a molecule create a unique fingerprint Raman spectrum that helps you to identify what molecule is responsible for the scattering. As an optical technique, Raman is very high throughput and allows you to get a result within seconds. It also offers the ability for multiplex uh, detection, meaning that you can detect multiple analytes at the same time, provided, of course, that you are able to separate out the, the Raman peaks that are for the, the different molecules. Decades ago, Raman spectroscopy required bulky lasers and detectors, but with advances in sensor technology and optical components, Raman instruments 
are usually now fairly small that so that they can really fit into the palm of your hand. So how do you detect adulteration with ramen? So edible oils um, from different sources contain different ratios or different types of fatty acids. And this gives rise to variations in the Raman spectral signature. So if you were to um, say, look at a, the lauric acid, which is mainly found in coconut oils, um, and you compare it with, um, let's say palmitic acid, which is found mainly in palm oils, you can see some slight differences in the spectrum, even though they might not be so obvious. But using a correlation algorithm, it is possible to show that uh, they have slight differences in, um, in the, the Raman signature. So taking advantage of this difference, you can implement a, a detection approach using the MISA instrument. First, of course, you would have to store a reference spectrum of the sample or, or, or analyte that you're interested in. And then for the samples that you're interested in, you do a measurement and then you do a comparison um, of the correlation and you ask the question, is the correlation between your, the sample that you just measured, is, is it higher or lower than a set threshold that you've set? And if it, the answer is yes, then you have a positive identification or you could configure it as a pass. And if it's no, then of course the sample fails uh, and it tells you that it's different. So for more advanced analysis, you can combine Raman with chemometrics. In this work, we have combined Raman data with PCA analysis to differentiate or, and identify different oil types. We were able to correctly identify different oils that we bought from grocery stores. Um, the squares in the P in, in the, um, the graph here shows that we were able to detect cor and correctly identify all the different types of oils that we purchased. The squares that are highlighted with a hashtag that is an a indication of a close match, but still uh, different enough that it doesn't uh, suffice for a pass. Uh, for more details of this um, application, you can refer to our white paper, which you can download from the Metro website. So Raman itself is a very weak effect. So unless you are, you are having bulk amount of materials, you usually cannot get a good Raman spectrum. So this means that if you want to detect trace levels of a contaminant in, for example, oils, you're not gonna be able to, detect, to, to do it using this method. To get from sort of non-targeted testing, um, like I've shown you to targeted testing, it was discovered that nanostructures, particularly gold and silver nanostructures can greatly enhance the Raman scattering by billions of times if the molecule of interest is close enough to the surfaces of these nanostructures. Because this effect depends on a surface, it was named surface enhanced Raman, uh, Raman scattering or SIRS. This technique allows us to practically detect analytes in the PPM to PPV ranges. Because SIRS relies on the interaction of the molecule with a surface, it doesn't really work well if the analyte doesn't have 
functional groups that interact or sort of stick to the surface. Fortunately for us, a lot of contaminants like pesticides and artificial colorings do contain good functional groups of nitrogens and sulfurs that show strong interaction. So we're able to detect those fairly easily. And at Metrum, we offer a uh, variety of SERS materials that can perform this uh, SERS test. We specialize in uh, nanoparticle colloids, gold or silver, and we also have a test strip with printed nanomaterials that allows you to do the SERS testing. So as an example, um, we looked at trying to detect uh, fantion, which is one of the common organophosphate pesticides used to control olive fruit flies in olive groves. So the, the problem is, of course, that widespread spraying of olive orchards can sometimes resolve in, result in olive oils that occasionally exceed the maximum allowed uh, limit for the pesticide. And the fact that you have a very complex matrix with olive oil and the presence of interference, this can usually make analysis of pesticide residues fairly difficult. So in this example, we spiked the fention uh, into extra virgin olive oil at very concentrations ranging from 0.5 microgram per mil to up to 100 microgram per mil. And the sample processing steps were um, involved dilution of the oil sample with cyclohexane, followed by a extraction with acetonitrile. And we did a concentration step by evaporating the acetonitrile. Finally, we added the gold nanoparticles for the SERS measurement. Um, and on the right-hand side here, you see the, the detection of the different concentrations of fentyron in the oil, um, showing fairly beautiful SERS peaks from the fentyron. And I should stress that with the, the method that I've described, very little solvent was used for the sample preparation. So only about half a millimeter, uh, milliliter of the solvent was used. And the total sample preparation time from uh, doing all the extraction to the actual analysis took uh, about 15 minutes. We also tested uh, a different organophosphate. It's called dimethoat. Um, and in this case, we use our silver, uh, silver strips, test strips material with our MISA. And the plot on the left-hand side shows the different concentrations um, that we were able to get with the SERS test. This is a slightly different um, application example. So the previous two examples were talking about, you know, looking at the final product, but what if you were able to detect the pesticides on the fruit itself, on the olive, before you convert them into oil? So in this example, we use the, the test strip as a swab. Uh, and basically we try to swab the, the, the fruit and pick up the pesticide residue and detect it before it's been processed. And in this example, we use thyrum as the test analyte. Thyrum is a commonly used fungicide in many orchards to control fungal growth. And <clears throat> excuse me, on the left-hand side, you see the characteristic peaks for 
um, theorem. With this technique, you could also achieve some sort of semi-quantitative analysis if you're careful enough. So what you try to do, of course, is to measure the peak intensities of um, the spectrum at different concentrations and use that to build a sort of calibration curve where you can sort of then, uh, depending on your sample measurement, able to correlate and, and determine the um, concentration of your sample. So to wrap up, um, I'll go over the features of our MISA um, platform. It's a portable Raman SERS instrument that is intended for lab and field usage. We have a fairly large library of common contaminants uh, that um, if found in oils and in other food items. But we also offer the user the capability to build their own libraries. We have a proprietary SERS algorithm on board, which help to reduce the interference from food matrices so that you get a, a more accurate result. And the instrument uh, and the software has ability to generate reports and share data via Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, or cellular networks. And this last point is fairly important because that allows us to sort of integrate Raman with mobile communication. Uh, as I mentioned uh, in the beginning, the, the MISA can be operated through a, a mobile device. We can also take advantage of that mobile device to take pictures of the sample so that there's a record of where the, the sample, uh, what the sample looked like, and also where the sample was measured. And moving um, a step ahead, now that you have all this data, imagine if you have sort of multiple instruments at different locations, you can sort of pull data into a command center, which then allows you to have a, a, a sort of global or, or global or a countrywide view of the problem and allow you to correctly uh, implement responses to mitigate the problem. So this is my summary um, of our uh, device. MISA is a low cost mobile Raman platform that can help complement other uh, existing food testing technologies to combat edible oils contamination and adulteration. But really the usage is uh, beyond just edible oils, but it's definitely applicable to a lot of other uh, food types as well. And I think my time is up. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I'll be very happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you, uh, Wei. That was a really interesting technology. And we, we did generate a number of questions here, so so be ready. Uh, first question. Okay. What, oh, I'm going to mess up this word. What excitation wavelength does MISA use? And how does this state relate to the fluorescent, fluoros, fluorescence backgrounds that occurs in different organic or biological samples? So the MISA uses a 785 nanometer laser. Um, if it was just a, a purely Raman measurement, of course, the fluorescence can be an issue uh, for certain samples. 
for SERS measurements, the SERS actually, because you are using such low concentrations of um, materials, uh, and also the fact that uh, with SERS, you, are, you have some nanostructures that actually reduces the amount of fluorescence. So with SERS, the, the fluorescence, the technique, um, fluorescence is not such a big issue. Okay, great. Next question. There are a huge range of possible contaminants and adulterants that might be present in an oil. Is there any kind of screening test to give you a clue as to what might be worth looking for in more detail? Um, so I think this is the, the case where um, the MISA can work with other technologies in order to sort of solve the problem. Uh, the MISA is not a, a, a GC, uh, because with GC, you could probably like uh, add your sample and, and run it and look at the peaks and try to be able to detect all the contaminants or pesticides, for example, that are in the sample. Uh, the, the MISA with, with SIRS, you sometimes might need to have a, a sort of idea of what it is that you're looking for, even though we do have like a la large library that you can compare the, the acquired spectrum against, but it does help to know, have a rough idea of what type of contaminant it is present in your sample so that you can select um, the appropriate, um, say sample preparation approaches and also match to a um, appropriate library. Okay, next question. What is the measurement area? Is there an issue with sample presentation heterogeneity caused by the dispersion of hotspots between colloidal gold or me metallic structures in the strip? Yeah, so the, the measurement area, um, so I, I guess it did, um, the, the, the um, person is referring to is the size of uh, our, our substrate. Um, the strip, our test strips are about a, a centimeter square uh, in area. For the colloids, of course, it, it's, it's different. Uh, but I think it's well known that, that there's, uh, SERS is well known for variability. Uh, with our instrument, we have a unique feature called raster uh, ORS, uh, where the, we are actually rastering moving the laser over the whole sample. And so we are not looking at a single spot on the substrate surface, but we are scanning uh, a fairly large area over the surface to give a more averaged spectrum of uh, the sample. And that does help with uh, sort of random hotspots. All right, Thank thanks Wei. We do have a follow-up. Uh to the heterogeneity question, what is the error for replicatable for replicate measurements? So um, the typical, um, based on our testing, I think we can achieve within 20% of variability um, in our measurements using, also it depends on the type of material right so if you look if you're talking about the colloids it's more sensitive and it's more reproducible the strips is uh, have a little bit higher variability uh, but it sort of compensates for that in in terms of uh, um, ease of use it's it's a lot easier to use a test strip than to try and do a colloid measurement Okay, and a follow-up to the area, what is the laser spot size itself or the, or the raster? Uh, the, yeah. So the laser spot, I believe, uh, I, I would have to look at my technical documentation. Uh, it's around 40 microns, but the raster pattern itself, because it's constantly moving uh, over the area, it's about a millimeter square. Okay. What about the uh, data? Um, does that get housed in the cloud or where does the data get uploaded to? 
So the data can be stored on the the, the device. So if, okay. if it's uh, if you're using a cell phone, it's stored on there. Uh, if you're using a laptop, of course, it's stored on the on the laptop. But you can then share the data to your secure database if you want, or you could send it to um, a colleague so that they can uh, have that data as well. So it's it becomes very portable once you you do the acquisition. Okay. All right. There are no other questions for Wei. Thanks a lot, Wei. Really appreciate your time. Very informative. Okay. All right, next up, we're going to do a little investigation into preparation, into seed preparation. Uh, our next presenter on uh, flaking mill, optimizing performance in oil seed applications. Uh, our presenter is uh, Doug Rusher. Doug is an applications engineer for CPM, Ross Camp Champion, with 18 years of experience in the industry. His duties include sales, startup, training, and support of the equipment. Doug's challenged to be an expert in all phases of our equipment, a really strong veteran member of, of our team. He graduated from Iowa State University with a Bachelor of Science degree in Industrial Education and Technology. And with that, uh, Doug, take it away. Good morning. My name is Doug Rusher. I'm an applications engineer for Ross Camp Champion. And today I'd like to talk about optimizing flaking mill performance in oil seed applications. If you have any questions, please send them to my email address at the bottom of the screen. Before we talk about the flaking mill itself, let's talk about safety. If you're going with a tool to open a machine to work on it, you must lock out or tag out the machine before entering to remain safe. Now let's discuss the purpose of flaking, which is to improve extraction results by increasing the surface area, reducing the distance solvents must travel, and rupturing cell walls. We're taking a particle that has an area to volume ratio of approximately 50 to one and reducing it to an area to volume ratio of approximately 200 to one. Again, this is to reduce the distance uh, solvent must travel We want to always operate the flaking mill at or near full capacity. We need to maintain a uniform feed distribution, which will allow us to maintain a uniform roll temperature, maintain uniform roll wear, and prevent roll to roll contact. We want to balance the feed rate and roll pressure to obtain the desired flake thickness and motor load. Do not run the flaking mill below 70% of the rated capacity. So if your plant capacity changes, don't simply throttle back all the flaking mills. If you're getting 70% or lower um, in capacity, then you need to look at turning off a flaking mill or two. We wanna compare the seed or crack temperature to the roll temperature with an infrared device. When the roll temperature is within seven to 10 degrees F, of the crack temperature, the rolls are considered fully loaded. Any upset in this condition may cause the rolls to form hot spots. The roll bearings uh, require lubrication. We use the 23248 bearings that has an L10 life in excess of 100,000 hours with proper lubrication. We recommend that 10 to 12 ounces uh, of grease be added every 30 days. The bearings should be purged annually. Check bearing temperatures weekly. Idler bearings require one to two ounces every week. Other bearings require four to six grams monthly, such as the feed gate. And always use a high quality lithium-based grease. 
from the factory that are filled with mobile XHP222. If you're gonna change grease, uh, make sure that it is compatible or purge your bearings before you change the grease. This is an assembly view of the adjustable roll. We have the cover off and annually it's necessary to remove that cover and to purge all the old grease uh, because the grease will harden over time. And even though you're greasing it, if that hardened grease blocks the flow, the grease will not enter the bearing. For the drives, we look at alignment and tension. The inner roll drive belt tension is maintained hydraulically. We'll set the belt, belt tension to 150 to 200 PSI on the control console. The inner roll drive belts will typically last three to five years with proper tension. The high torque drive main drive belt should track towards the motor side. Uh, it's easier on the motor bearings. We need to check the drive belt alignment every 30 days. And the drive belts typically last seven to 10 years with proper care. This is a, a picture showing the inner roll drive side. It's our current design. Our long span is on top. So we're pulling back on this arm to tension our long span. When this arm bottoms out on the hydraulic cylinder is time to change belts. We always want to change belts as a full set. This is the uh, hydraulic control console. This pressure reducing valve adjusts the inner roll drive belt tension, which is displayed on the leftmost gauge. Then we have left and right roll pressure, which is controlled by these pressure reducing valves and the feed gate pressure. For the main drive belt, we need to check for a half inch deflection at 25 pounds of force. We do that by measuring the long span of the belt and checking deflection at the center. Two situations that we have to have in order to make uniform flakes are the rolls need to be in parallel. If you look down on the rolls, they should be even from end to end to ensure that you're making a uniform flake. The rolls also need to remain in tram. So that means they're in the same plane. So as you're looking directly on the rolls, they are in line. Some of the factors that affect roll profile are roll shape, which is affected by wear, roll deflection, which is most affected by roll proportions. Deflection is more significant at higher pressures. Roll temperature is most affected by feeding. Roll temperature is also affected by roll shape. Some possible sources for uneven roll temperatures are uneven feeding, which is due to buildup, such as in the hoppers, by the feed gate, and in the feeder housing. Uh, agglomerations, which are often found behind the feed gate, in the roll nip, in the finger guards, and in the flow directors. You need to check the scrapers for any wear and make sure that they're not contacting the scraper stops. If the scraper assembly is connecting the scraper stops, then they're not sufficiently cleaning the rolls. Look for any uh, and eliminate any dust accumulations on the scraper blades, flow directors, roll housing, cheek plates, and doors and covers. Rolls operating near full capacity, we need to cycle the roll pressure on every two to four hours to maintain a more consistent pressure or temperature from end to end. You can think of this as starting a mill out when it's cold. The roll is a certain diameter. As it heats, it grows. If, it's, if the rolls are not cycled to accommodate that growth, then you'll get um, roll to roll contact and develop hot spots. These are pictures showing dust accumulation. You can see if dust is not cleaned out from the machine uh, every shift, it will accumulate and that rides on the roll and causes a hot spot, which will 
make uneven flakes. We recommend that aspiration is from below the flaking mill. So the cracks come in and we have our aspiration at the top of our machine. So we use gravity to help clean the dust, help sweep through the whole machine. So why do rolls wear unevenly? And it's because heavy impurities such as sand and mineral um, feed down the center of the roll where roll wear is increased. So the, the center wears more, but we say that the roll ends become high. Okay, and when the roll ends become high, we have excessive pressure on the ends of the rolls. Flakes become measurably thinner on the roll ends. The roll end temperatures become measurably high. The roll ends will spall or form pressure bars. And the rolls are just like a tire. A tire is round, but it is deformed where it touches the ground. It has a flat spot. Our rolls are the same way, where they contact, they flex, and continual flexing can lead to work hardening of the rolls. A couple different types of roll material. On the top, we have a chilled iron roll that has a hard surface and a softer gray iron core. These can either be a static cast or a centrifugally cast roll. On the bottom is an indefinite chill roll. These rolls are more resilient, and it's essentially the same material from the surface to the core. And they can also be static or centrifugally cast. So chilled iron rolls may spall, or they may form pressure bars if subjected to high pressure metal to metal contact. On the other hand, indefinite chilled rolls are highly resistant to spalling, but may develop pressure bars if subjected to metal to metal contact. To correct pressure bars, it's often necessary to remove all the work hardened material, which may extend into the roll phase 10 to 50 thousandths or more. When grinding rolls to correct pressure bars, rolled hardness should be checked to ensure all work hardened material is removed. Spalling damage, on the other hand, cannot be repaired. The rolls must be turned and are ground to remove all damaged material and prevent further crack propagation. This is an indefinite chill roll showing characteristics of washboarding. They start with a hard spot on one end of the roll and if not relieved right away, that hard spot will transfer across the full length of the roll. Chilled iron rolls, um, however, are a little bit harder and if the ends get hard and not relieved, uh, the end can break off. So for roll end grinding, how often do we need to grind the ends? And every four to six weeks is typical. We must check flake thicknesses and roll temperature daily. So how much do we remove when we grind the ends of the rolls? And the minimum taper width is three to four inches and two to three thousandths deep. However, each facility is a little bit different on how the machine is fed. So a taper width of 10 to 16 inches is not out of the ordinary. So for roll end grinding, how long do we need to grind? And one to four hours per machine is common. We do more frequent grinding, will require less total time required. So for roll end grinding, we do this to eliminate high pressure roll-to-roll uh, -roll contact. We first clean off the dust from the machine and block the scrapers off the roll, paint a stripe across the roll and briefly touch the rolls together to check for actual roll-to-roll -roll contact. This is a form that we give you to fill out where you would note the machine, the pressure on the left and right side, the amp draw from the main motor, inner roll drive tension, the crack temperature, and take nine temperatures across the end of the roll, noting the flake thickness on the left, center, and right side, and then record any abnormalities. Then maintenance can check over time and see that the temperature is getting higher at the end of the rolls. The flakes are getting thinner at the end of the rolls, indicating a need 
to grind the rolls. So using the information, and the information uh, is only useful if it's utilized, high temperature and thick flakes would indicate excessive feed rates. High temperatures and thin flakes indicate insufficient feed rates, uneven feeding, uneven roll wear, or a hot spot. And hot spots have a specific cause, and they are excessive feeding, obstruction in the feed stream, roll diameter change, or scraper malfunction. So when we grind the rolls, we paint a stripe along the ends and we touch them together and where the paint is rubbed off is where it needs to be ground. Here you can see that the end is a high spot and needs to be relieved. So we go ahead and grind the roll, paint another stripe, touch the rolls together, and you can see that it's been sufficiently relieved so the roll is, has been relieved at the end sufficiently. For full face grinding, how often is that needed? And the answer is every 12 to 24 months. How much do we remove when we full face grind? And eight to 10 thousandths is a typical minimum just to clean up the roll. 20 to 50 thousandths or more may be required to correct taper. 40 to 50 thousandths or more may be required to correct washboarding. So how long do we need to grind the rolls for? And typically eight to 12 hours is pretty common for a typical cleanup. However, 40 to 100 hours or more may be needed to take care of severe washboard or severe taper. And again, more frequent grinding equates less total time required to grind. Here's another example. We told the customer to paint a stripe across the roll. They painted the whole roll, which gives a good visual. They touched it together. Any place that the paint is rubbed off is a high spot and needs to be ground. And you can tell that this roll has severe washboarding. This is an illustration of our roll surface grinder mounted to the rear of the flaking mill. The roll surface grinder can be used to grind the ends of the rolls or full face. We have a slow down drive available to slow the rolls down to approximately 30 RPM, uh, which aids in uh, more rapid uh, stock removal if you have damaged rolls such as a severe taper or washboarding. So to manage the wear, we must measure the roll diameter and shim as required to keep the rolls centered in the machine. When the machine is new, we're feeding directly into the nip of the roll. The back roll is a fixed roll. So as it wears, that nip point is moving back into the machine. In order to keep that centered, we must put spacers in it to keep it centered in the machine. Also, because the roll diameters change, we must replace the cheek plates with new part numbers that are cut to fit smaller diameter rolls. We must also restore the roll end chamfer to the three quarter inch by 30 degrees as when they were new. We need to also maintain bearing housing to top tension member clearance of eight to 10 thousandths cold and six to eight thousandths hot. This is a chart showing our 32 inch machine, showing the different roll diameters and the corresponding cheek plates, cylinder shims, rear shims, and the distance that was added to that stroke. So, a word about cheek plates. We, we want to prevent any material from leaking around the ends of the rolls. However, um, to account for one tenth of 1% increase in white flake fat, a 3284 flaker will be, would have to leak two, over two tons of cracks a day to increase the white flake fat one tenth of 1%. So the moral of the story is don't run the cheek plate down against the roll and carve into it, okay? 
there should be a 10 to 20 thousandths gap between the cheek plate and the roll face, depending on what seed you're flaking. We also need to look at the scraper blades. Uh, the original equipment are quarter inch thick and they must match the width of the machine itself. If the scrapers are too short, they will cut into the face of the roll. If they're too long, they will cut into the ends of the roll. Any questions? Thanks a lot, Doug. What a what a great look into uh, into the preparation side of, of seed preparation. Uh, a couple questions for you here. The first one: What is special about lithium grease, and is there any possibility of grease coming into contact with the seed? Yes, that's a good question. Uh, lithium grease uh, has a good temperature. Uh, it, it doesn't break down at a low temperature. Um, so we've been using lithium grease. Uh, in, in most of our equipment since I've been here and specifically in our flaker since about 2009, it's a good, it has offers good compatibility with other greases that are used in the plant. Um, as far as the possibility of it coming in contact uh, with the product, um, there, there is a chance uh, over the years, we've changed how we've greased our roll bearings. Um, and uh, in the past we've greased from the outside in so a little bit of grease could be getting in there. Um, uh, however, if that's a concern, a food grade grease uh, could be looked at for that application. Great, so another question, really general question. Um, give us a couple of elements um, of, of seed preparation that go into making a good flake. What can, what's done to the seed you know, what, what are some things of that crack as it comes in? What makes for good flakes? You bet. Um, we, we want to properly condition. Let's talk about so, relating to soybean. We want to properly crack and condition soybean so it's pliable. If, if you don't have the right temperature um, and moisture to condition that, it's going to take more horsepower to make a good flake, even if you can make a good flake. Uh, and also, if it's not conditioned enough, um, you um, you may be making a lot of fines, which are undesirable. Great, great. Well, that is all the questions. Thanks a lot, Doug. Appreciate your time. All right, our next presenter this morning is Gabriel Dufour. Get his bio up here. Gabriel Dufour serves as a global business development manager for Eco Extract since October 2020. He holds an MSc in Food, Agriculture, and Life Sciences from Agro Paris Tech an MSc in Energy Economics and Sustainable Development from the IFP School. He began his career working in the oil and protein industry with the Avril Group in France, where he was involved in the strategy and corporate development department. In 2017, he joined La Safre Group, a world leader in fermentation and yeasts, where he held positions in strategic projects, coordination, and business development for nutrition and healthcare industry. Um, really a great transition here from uh, the flaky mill into extraction. Take it away, Gabriel. Hello, everyone. I am Gabriel Dufour, and I'm in charge of business development activities at global level for eco-extract. 
The objective of this presentation is to give you a better understanding of this innovative extraction solution representing a bio-based and clean alternative to hexane in oil extraction. First, let me tell you a few words about Minafin Group, the company supporting the development of EcoExtract. Minafin is a French and Belgian group focused on fine chemicals manufacturing with two main activities. First, a CDMO business in the pharma industry. And second, a renewable and bio-based chemistry business targeting different applications such as technical additives, cosmetics or agro-market. In 2021, Minafin counts approximately 900 employees across the world with 10% dedicated to innovation and R&D. The group operates six production sites across the world with four implantations in Western Europe and two in the US. Within Minafin Group, EcoExtract is part of the bio-based chemistry branch and is actually an internal business unit with the mission of developing eco-extraction and bio-based technologies for nutrition and healthcare industries. Our first solution, promoted under the uh, eco-extract trade name, is a bio-based solvent designed for the extraction of vegetable oils and natural ingredients with lipophilic properties. As a consequence, our targeted market segments are the following. First, the oilseeds crushing industry, that is processing the main oilseeds commodities grown on this planet, soybean, rapeseed, sunflower, and so on, to manufacture oils and proteins for food, feed, and biodiesel mainly. Second, the specialty oilseeds industry, manufacturing high added value oils for food, but also for cosmetics. And third, the natural-based ingredient industry with companies focused on the extraction of natural ingredients with lipophilic properties from a wide range of sources. It can be plants, algae, microorganisms, or other sources and targeting different market applications such as food, cosmetics, flavors and fragrances, and nutraceutics. Eco-extract technology is an innovative solution to extract your natural-based ingredients, oils, and proteins. And behind the trade name Eco-extract, there is a pure liquid solution of 99.9% .9 of 2-methyloxolane. 2-methyloxolane is a bio-based extraction solvent derived from agricultural byproducts. We'll focus on its plant-based origin in the next slide before coming back to this one. 2-methyloxolane is a cyclic ether issued from carbohydrates derived from lignocellulosic biomass which represents the most abundant biomass resources on Earth. Eco-extract production is thus derived from the upcycling of sugarcane industry waste, the sugarcane bagasse. Our plant, located in Memphis, Tennessee, in the US, is converting furfurol into 2-methyloxolane by different steps of hydrogenation and is already producing several thousand tons of product each year. 2-methyloxolane is recognized as a 100% bio-based solvent by the, by the bio-preferred program of the USDA. Coming back to this slide, the second feature of the product that I want to highlight is its high performance. 
Eco extract is showing very good results and high yield in oil extraction. Basically, comparative extraction tests using exane and eco extract conducted with the same protocols at lab scale on more than 20 oil seeds showed similar yield in oil extraction. 2-methyloxolane has similar thermal values when compared to hexane and very high affinity with lipids and lipophilic substances. It has very slight solubility with water, enabling to extract more polar compounds such as phospholipids or antioxidants. In terms of quantity, so the yields uh, compared to hexane were the same, and in terms of quality, the crude oils obtained were very similar in terms of fatty acid profile and sterol profile, but they were a bit richer in phospholipids and antioxidants when compared with an hexane extraction process. And these results were confirmed later on at, la at larger scale. I'll give more precision in the next slides of this presentation. Then, Eco Extract is presenting an excellent toxicological profile, completely compatible with the use for food and feed. In the past decade, Minafin Group invested a lot of time and money in scientific studies to support these conclusions. There is no carcinogenic, mutagenic, or reprotoxic effect, nor endocrine disruption or neurotoxicity reported for 2-methyloxolane, unlike other petrochemical solvents. Regarding the safety in industrial operation, the liquid is flammable and requires to be handled with caution in ATEX environment, but its very low odor threshold allows workers to immediately detect the presence of solvent vapors way before it reaches dangerous levels in the factories. And it must be noted that 2-methyloxolane electrical conductivity is much higher than hexane, the industry standard, thus reducing the risk of electrical charge accumulation in the piping. Together, these parameters show enhanced safety in maintenance and day-to-day -day operations in industrial facilities. Regarding environmental impact, 2-methyloxolane offers a renewable alternative, reducing the need for non-renewable non petroleum-based chemicals. Bio-based products are known to play an increasingly important role in reducing greenhouse gases emission that exacerbate global climate change. However, turning a molecule into a green carbon origin is not necessarily sufficient to reduce environmental impact especially CO2 emission. Therefore, despite uh, its high bio-based content, a deeper analysis has been initiated back in 2012 to determine the global impact of 2-methyloxolane on carbon emissions through a life cycle analysis conducted with Rowan University. And this analysis showed a 90% decrease in CO2 footprint for 2-methyloxolane when compared to standard petro petrochemical solvents. Most recently, in 2019, an ecotoxicological profile of the product has been carried out as part of a rich evaluation process to determine environmental impact of the biosolvent if released in the environment. And those tests revealed the inocuity of the solvent towards the environment and especially in water. In addition, its biodegradability has been proven. Last but not least, 
compared to any other alternative to hexane in extraction, our simulations are indicating that eco-extract process show cost effectiveness, cost effectiveness and a competitive offering on the market. Let me tell you more about our latest industrial scale-up works. After conducting many scale-up tests to compare eco-extract and hexane, eco-extract team went to larger scales and the results were very promising as well. Pilot trials and small-scale production on soy, canola and, sunf and sunflower with eco-extract demonstrate robust and trusted performance in oil extraction. Eco-extract delivers equal or higher extraction yield when compared with hexane and basically showed a complete defating of the different matrices, more or less below 1% oil remaining in the meal, and this at different scales, 80 kg batches, or continuously on more than one ton at Crown Pilot Plant in the US, for example. In 2020, the team then successfully adapted a 10 ton per day extraction plant in Mexico and carried out a one week production campaign around the clock with no stop. In a continuous process, including extraction, oil and meal desolvantization, and biosolvent recovery, EcoExtract provided a well-defated and desolvantized meal containing below 0.7% of residual oil and 15 ppm of redu residual biosolvent in the meal. The biosolvent was continuously recycled and recovered by simple decantation of condensates. As you can imagine, this successful industrial test was a major milestone for the project and its industrial scale-up. In 2021, we are currently set setting up eco-extract technology in two small extraction sites in Europe that should be available for commercial production or industrial demonstration in the coming weeks. Regarding market approvals, the pharma grade of our product is already sold for synthesis in the pharma market, making our industrial facility in Memphis already competitive for the production of the biosolvent. In this industry, 2-methyloxolane is classified as low toxicity solvent, just like ethanol in the same classification. Concerning our targeted applications in nutrition and healthcare industries, eco-extract can be used for the production of organic cosmetic oils. EcoCert is by the way attesting that eco-extract solution can be used for manufacturing Cosmos approved ingredients and raw materials. Eco-extract can also be used for the production of feed materials in Europe and China. Organic recognition is targeted in Europe and approval is expected next year in US and Canada after final animal testing this spring on ruminants and ants. Regarding food applications, we are currently under the European Food Safety Authority review in Europe. So food approvals are pending in Europe and in the US and Canada and are expected next year, early 2022. Wrap up slide. As you understood, Eco-extract is an efficient and innovative technology presenting an alternative to hexane in the extraction of oils and natural ingredients. It is bio-based, derived from agricultural waste, and completely safe for consumers, for workers, and the environment. After several years in development, 
and now in advanced scale-up phase, the technology is very close to the market. EcoExtract offers an unprecedented business opportunity for the industry to produce oils and proteins with no use of petrochemicals in the manufacturing process. In addition, the solution will potentially be recognized organic in food and feed applications and is already recognized as is in the cosmetic industry. 2021 will be another major step forward in the development of the technology as first extraction sites using eco-extract process will be available for towel manufacturing activities or industrial demonstration starting from the second semester of this year. I would like to conclude this presentation with very pragmatic and practical propositions for those in the audience who wants to further investigate eco-extract solution. If you are willing to test our biosolvent at lab scale, feel free to request a sample. If you are willing to manufacture hexane-free oils or proteins, we now have a network of toll manufacturing partners in Europe that are able to propose commercial production or industrial demonstration using eco-extract process on a wide range of oil seeds. If you are willing to investigate eco-extract option for your own extraction plant, we can set up a first discussion with our internal engineering team to evaluate the prefeasibility of the use of eco-extract in your existing facility. And if you simply want to know more about the technology, feel free to ask your questions or to reach out after AOCS annual meeting. I thank you for your attention and for your time, and I'll be glad to answer the question of the audience. Thank you. All right, thanks for that great look at some uh, interesting new technology um, in, in the extraction process. Uh, a few questions for you. First question, I understand that eco extract is currently more expensive than hexane. Does it have the potential to economically replace hexane for commodity oils? Uh, this, is, this is a question we have, uh, yeah, typically, of course. Um, the first, Simulations we, we carried out on our different uh, process simulation uh, tools showed that there is competition with Exane. Uh, it's a bit uh, higher in price, but not uh, very high. So yeah, uh, the, the idea is to implement the solution in an uh, in existing uh, Exane facility or to, or to design a new plant using using the technology, but we we definitely think uh, there is uh, cost competitiveness for this solution, and uh, and this is uh, what's differentiate us uh, when compared to uh, other uh, alternatives to uh, to exane typically. Okay, good. Next question. And this is a word I'm going to mess up, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, the question is higher. It's either phospholipids fos lipids or phospholipids in oil could be a disadvantage. How much more does the oil contain? Uh, yeah, depending on the, the applications, uh, it can be an advantage or a disadvantage. Uh, typically, we we have more phospholipids and antioxidant in the in the in the crude oil, uh, so it depends on the on the oil seeds, obviously. Uh, so we have yeah two two percent more uh, approximately. Okay, about two percent more. Got it. Well, a final question here is. Eco extract more or less a drop in replacement for hexane, and what if any modifications to extraction equipment or 
or um, well, yeah, just equipment in the extraction area are necessary. Yeah, the, the particularity of our solution is that we, we definitely think it can be implemented in, uh, in existing uh, exane uh, facility. Uh, so um, there, are, there are some modifications uh, to be made in, in the plant, but it's, you know, uh, case by case. Um, but typically the modification uh, we see uh, is, you know, first to check the, the gaskets uh, of a plant because the, the solvent is very um, efficient. So there is a need to replace uh, uh, incompatible polymeric materials in the plant. So there is a, a diagnosis, a diagnostic to, to make uh, first regarding the, the, the gaskets in the plant. Um, then we, we recommend that it's optional to, uh, to, to implement a, a water scrubber instead of a mineral oil system to capture the, the, the solvent residues in the vent. And the, the other uh, modification that is also optional, uh, but uh, it's the, the replacement of the wastewater boiler by a nasotropic uh, distillation column to, to maximize the recovery of the of the solvent in the in the water phase after liquid 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 extraction. So these are the main uh, changes we see uh, in uh, in existing plant. But uh, as I said, it's really case by case, and uh, there is a need to uh, you know to audit a plant before uh, uh, knowing all the. The, the change in equipments uh, that are needed to uh, to switch from from exane to echo extract or to use at least the two uh, solvents in parallel. Okay, so that leads very well into the next question, which is about solvent recovery. How much more energy would be required to remove this solvent from oil as compared to removal of hexane from oil? Again, it's, it's hard to, 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 to answer because it's uh, really case by uh, case, uh, depending on, on the plant, on the existing setup. Of course, uh, the, the boiling point uh, is, uh, is higher, so uh, the, the process will require um, a bit more energy. Uh, so, but we, we've developed uh, an internal tool uh, on ChemCAD software to, um, to run simulations, to compare uh, an existing exane plant to, uh, to uh, an in silico uh, echo extract process. And so we are able to, to compare, uh, to compare uh, you know, typically the energy consumptions and so on. Uh, so I invite you to, to get in touch with us uh, if you want to, uh, to simulate uh, one, one of your plants typically. But it's, it's hard to say, you know, uh, it's hard to, to, to give a, a rough number uh, for each plant. Okay. So the next question goes back to the phospholipids lipids question. Uh, by 2% more, do you mean that oil with 2% of the PL using hexane would in turn, conta would in turn contain 4% with eco extract? Uh, yeah, approximately, yeah. Okay. That's a good clarification. Okay, no more questions. It looks like uh, for Gabriel. Thanks a lot for your time. Uh, really interesting uh, with an eco solution uh, to potentially replace hexane. That was great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. All right, up next in our industry update, uh, we have Brian Cook, technical manager from Clariant out of Sellersburg, Indiana. He's going to report on the adsorptive removal of contaminants from fats and oils for production of biofuels. And uh, Brian, if you want to take it away, first tell us a little bit about yourself and before uh, we uh, hear your presentation. 
Hello, everybody. Manager for North America. And I have the pleasure to talk to you about the removal of contaminants from fats and oils that are used to produce biofuels. To get started, we'll start with a brief introduction look at the uh, adsorption process and talk a little bit about bleaching clay characteristics. We'll then move in and talk about both biodiesel and renewable diesel production and how those contaminants that are present in the fats and oils need to be removed for those processes. And we'll end with a brief summary. So, so as an introduction, both biodiesel and renewable diesels are both derived from fats and oils. The biodiesel, the difference between the two, biodiesel is a methyl ester. We'll go into a little bit more detail on what that entails. Whereas renewable diesel converts those fats and oils directly to hydrocarbons, very similar to petroleum-based diesels. Some of the pro uh, problems that arise from the fats and oils is they can they can contain contaminants which can interfere with the reaction in biodiesel and also decrease the catalyst for the renewable diesel process. For biodiesel, we're going to look at the pretreatment of the fat and oil to remove contaminants in the feedstock, as well as, as after the reaction is completed, there are some contaminants that still need to be removed before that product is actually biodiesel. For renewable diesel, we're mainly concerned with the pretreatment, trying to remove those contaminants as much as possible up front to protect the catalyst and help the life of that catalyst. So just as a basic introduction, uh, we have fat, saturated fatty acids and unsaturated fatty acids are connected to a glycerol backbone. That's what makes up the triglyceride. Saturated fatty acids are more stable. They're less prone to go, undergo oxidation, but especially for biodiesel, they cause code flow issues uh, at the end of the process. Unsaturated fatty acids are less stable and they're more prone to undergo oxidation, which is more important for biodiesel because biodiesel converts those fatty acids into methyl esters. And so you still have those fatty acid molecules there that can undergo oxidation. Whereas with renewable diesel, those are converted to hydrocarbons and you don't have the oxidation issues. So now we're going to talk about the absorption of contaminants and a little bit about bleaching clays. To start with here, we need to understand the difference between absorption and adsorption. Absorption is just the accumulation of the liquid within a solution, whereas adsorption, you're actually selectively, selectively removing contaminants. So the best example I can think of is if you had a solution of water with sodium hydroxide, that is totally dissolved. You put a sponge in, that sponge is gonna soak up both the hydro sodium hydroxide and the water. Whereas with adsorption, if you had that same situation and you took that sponge and squeezed it and just the water came out and the sodium hydroxide was held onto the sponge, then we're talking about an adsorption phenomenon. So when we're talking about the adsorption filtration process, we're gonna be removing those soluble impurities. It's also, also gonna provide depth filtration. As you build up the material in the filter cake, you're going to be removed down to one micron or less. So you're gonna result in a higher quality feedstock for both biodiesel or renewable diesel. You're gonna help achieve re regulatory specifications by removing those metals and contaminants up front. That'll help with the reaction as well. So uh, reaction efficiency is gonna be improved. And on renewable diesel, you're gonna increase the life of the catalyst. Just very briefly, we're gonna look at the origin of bentonite. Uh, Clarient produces uh, bentonite products as bleaching clays. So years ago, volcanoes shot up lava that had gas and ash. Sometimes that traveled as much as 16 miles. The ash, as it falls, it gets carried away by the wind and water. And over time, those deposits are subjected to high pressure temperatures and they form bentonite. 
So the, the landscape undergoes massive changes and what's left behind is the calcium bentonite products that's, that are then processed to make uh, clays. One of the things we don't look at is if you just dug the, the clay out of the ground and you know process that as is, you're gonna look at a surface area of about 60 mil, uh, square meters per gram and a bulk density of about 800 grams per liter. To increase that surface area and really give it a boost to remove those contaminants, that clay is subjected to acid with temperature, pressure, and time to form what we call a acid activated bleaching earth. So that's gonna increase the surface area to about 200 square meters per gram or a little higher and also reduce the bulk density. These products have been used for many years in the edible oil and mineral oil uh, industries and also in biofuels as well as we're talking about today. So to take a closer look at the biodiesel production, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on the reaction, but uh, basically you start with the triglycerides. So if you had 100 kilograms, you would react that with 10 kilograms of methanol in the presence of a catalyst to form 100 kilograms of fatty acid methyl esters and 10 kilograms of glycerin. So during this reaction, we do have glycerin as a byproduct that needs to be taken care of, whether that's sold or uh, used for a different application. We look closer at the process. As a, so, so you start with the fat or oil that gets reacted with methanol and you form biodiesel at the end of the process. But there's a lot of nuances to consider as you go through this reaction process. The first part of this is the, the pretreatment. So you, you wanna take your fat and oil and remove as much contaminants from that as possible. Uh, you'll have metals, you may have soap, you may have some residual uh, free fatty acid that needs to be removed, but that should be taken care of in the pretreatment process. And then another thing to keep in mind is if you have an FFA greater than 2%, you really wanna consider doing a direct esterification process where you directly convert those free fatty acids into methyl esters. If you didn't do that process and you went straight to the transesterification reaction with the sodium hydroxide catalyst, then you would form a lot of soap that would create a, uh, a lot of emulsion and it'd be very difficult to separate. So for that direct esterification process, an, an acid is used for the catalyst to convert that. So at the end of this process, we do have, we end up with uh, contaminated meth methyl esters after the glycerol is separated. You're gonna have some residual glycerin. Uh, you may have some metals that made it through that need to be removed at the tail end of the process. So you have a post uh, processing step that you have to do whether that's uh, just a water wash, a water wash with distillation, but typically after that, you still wanna do a final polish to make sure the biodiesel meets the specifications and that all the contaminants are removed. So that's where another uh, place where the use of a, an adsorbent can come into play. So as we look a little bit more detail on some of the contaminants that need to be removed, uh, the left side of this, page shows soap removal. So this particular feedstock had about 500 parts per million soap. That was treated and filtered with 0.2% bleaching clay, able to take that down to about 150 parts per million. But in order to remove all that soap that was in there a half percent by weight, bleaching clay was able to achieve 100% removal of the soap. Phosphorus is another contaminant that really can interfere with the reaction in biodiesel. You can see the, the Oil feedstock started with about 20 parts per million. And again, that same trend, we used 0.2%. That took it down to about 12 parts per million. But in order to get that down to uh, levels below detection, a half percent by weight bleaching clay was used. And it's important to get that phosphorus down as low as possible, preferably less than two parts per million for the reaction process. When we're looking at the post-reaction process, as I said, the glycerin gets separated from the fatty acid methyl esters. 
at this point, you have contam contaminated fatty acid methyl esters. They're not biodiesel until they meet the specifications. And so some of the contaminants that need to be removed include some residual glycerin, soaps, some metals, and excess methanol or catalyst that made it through the reaction. So looking at the post-reaction, some of the things to keep in mind, soap formation, that results again from the alkaline catalyst reaction with the free fatty acid. Uh, if you had oleic acid, for example, that would form sodium oleate. So that, uh, that can come from high FFA feedstocks, uh, excess water in the reaction. You wanna keep that reaction as dry as possible uh, because you can get direct saponification of the triglycerides if you have enough water in the system. It could also indicate an improper amount of catalyst. That can cause emulsion problems. And so when you go to separate the glycerin from the methyl esters, you're gonna have some, some issues trying to do that. Uh, soap is gonna require more adsorbent. The more soap you have, the more adsorbent you're gonna need. Uh, looking at some other things, uh, insufficient catalyst removal that can cause injector deposits, filter plugging in the engine, poor glycerin separation, uh, that can cause reversion, make the reaction go backwards so you can actually start to form mono dye and triglycerides. If you have a high acid value, that can decrease the shelf life. It can lead to oxidation. Those uh, acidic molecules can really act as a catalyst to further oxidize the, the product. Insufficient alcohol removal, uh, there's a safety concern there, of course, uh, but that can cause premature injector failures in the engine. So it's important to make sure all of these contaminants are removed, uh, not only up front, but at the final polish for the biodiesel production process. Looking at some other things to keep in mind, you may have some hazy precipitates that are found in the finished product. Those could be sterile glucosides, maybe some saturated monoglycerides. So those need to be removed as well uh, during this process. And the good thing about using an adsorbent to remove the other contaminants is they will remove these sterile glucosides as well at higher temperatures. So you, you don't have to cool the biodiesel down to actually precipitate those products out. You can do that at temperature and they'll be removed as well. So now we're gonna talk about renewable diesel and what contaminants are present and why they need to be removed from the process. So renewable diesel is a true car, uh, hydrocarbon, just like uh, petroleum diesel. It meets the ASTM specifications for diesel fuels. Uh, it has a different structure than biodiesel, which we've talked about. Biodiesel has that methyl ester structure, so you have to worry about oxidation, uh, not so much for renewable diesel. So for the renewable diesel, you're hydro treating the product with a catalyst, which is a highly active uh, catalyst. It's used to remove the oxygen and nitrogen and produce the diesel fuel for production. The pretreatment is essential for this process because that catalyst is very expensive and especially contaminants such as phosphorus really need to be removed because that can really poison the life of the catalyst and cause a significant investment uh, premature disposal of the catalyst. So when we're looking at bleaching clay and renewable diesel process, look at the, the process here. You start with the fat or oil, you go through the pretreatment process to remove the phosphorus and other metals, because other metals can interfere with the catalyst also, but phosphorus is the most problematic. That then goes through the hydro treating reactor with the catalyst to produce your renewable diesel, which is sometimes called uh, green diesel. And you have propane as a byproduct, which can be reused in the process. So here we're gonna focus on the pre-treatment process for this reaction. I'm not gonna go into all the detail on the chemical reaction that that takes place to form the hydrocarbons, but 
it's basically a decarbo decarboxylation of the organic molecules followed by a isomerization step to produce the petroleum based or the I'm sorry the renewable diesel uh, at the end of the process as well as propane and some naphtha as a byproduct as well so during the reaction the catalyst is required to conduct these reactions as, and as we've talked about before the life of that catalyst is important because it's a very expensive catalyst so as I've talked about a little bit the the catalyst poison is mainly by the phosphatide compounds these are some examples of phosphatides here on the right not going to go into detail on each one of them but there are some that are pretty, uh, uh, most relevant uh, like lecithin uh, you might be familiar with that but these these compounds contain phosphorus which can poison the catalyst and decrease the life of the catalyst the origin of phospholipids so a simplified drawing you see it has a nonpolar tail and a polar head they tend to form micelles. So a large amount of the phospholipids uh, come from cell membranes. And again, they migrate together to form micelles. So a, a lot of these can be removed uh, by the acid water degumming process to remove the hydratable uh, phospholipids, but the non-hydratable phospholipids will remain behind with the oil and those are the ones that need to be removed with an adsorbent. So looking at the non-hydratable phospholipids, they're often stabilized with calcium or magnesium. You can see the process here on the left. You have the, the phospholipids interacting with the acid clay. They get bound to the clay surface and then they're filtered out so they never reach the catalyst and uh, damage the catalyst. The right hat to side of the table here, you're just looking at the adsorbent dosage is going to be proportional to the phosphorus concentration. So, I mean, if you have something that has 340 parts per million phosphorus, you're going to be using a lot more adsorbent than you have than you would with something using a, a hundred parts per million phosphorus. So here is kind of a, uh, a diagram showing this is the filter cake that's uh, formed on the on the filter with the bleaching clay. There's your catalyst. You have your oil with the phosphorus going through hitting the catalyst and you see the phosphorus is left behind on the uh, filter cake so it never reaches the, the uh, catalyst. On the right there is just kind of a picture of what this isolated phospholip material looks like when it's trapped on the filter cake. So the next couple of slides, we're going to look at some examples. Uh, we can start it with a yellow grease. The phosphorus was 85 parts per million. That went through an acid uh, degumming and water wash to remove that down to about 19 parts per million. After the use of 1% by weight clay, that was re reduced down to one and a half parts per million, down to the less than that two parts per million as we talked about before. So the life of that catalyst is really going to be extended by removing all that phosphorus. And you can see a significant amount of it came out with the acid degumming and water wash process, but there's still a significant portion that needs to be removed with the adsorbent process. Again, here's another example. Uh, this particular example, you're looking at uh, some high performance bleaching earths. So they're using a lot more acid and temperature and pressure to really increase that surface area. And you can see it took about a 0.75% by weight treatment to remove that phosphorus that started at 20 parts per million down to less than one part per million. And then you also had a total metal removal of 91%. So you're really protecting that catalyst and preventing those contaminants from, from hitting that catalyst. Looking at filterability, that's another important aspect. We're able to control the porosity and the particle size. So 
Uh, looking at this this table, you can see the bottom. The x-axis shows the time it took to filter, and the y-axis shows how much oil was filtered in that time. So, Absorbent A was able to filter 300 grams of oil in about 80 seconds, whereas B and C took 200 and 300 seconds to to filter that same same oil. So filterability is another important aspect since you're doing a filtration process. Uh, you want to have high throughput as well as contaminant removal. So to summarize, adsorbents are processing aids that can help prevent the contaminants, uh, both for the biodiesel process as well as the renewable diesel process. The activation of those clays is, is done through the use of an acid with temperature and, and pressure. Uh, porosity and particle size are controlled so that you have uh, better filterability, better flow. Uh, the better flow you have, the more you can process and the less you'll have to clean out the filter. The adsorbents can also be used as a final polish for biodiesel to help achieve regulatory specifications. And the use of the catalyst or the adsorbent can really help increase the life of the catalyst and uh, help significantly with the cost and associated with the renewable diesel production process. So I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'll be more than glad to answer any questions when we have the question and answer uh, session later on. Thank you again. Thanks a lot, Brian. Uh, first, I want to apologize for the technical glitch that I caused. I did not give Brian the, the proper introduction. I'm going to do that uh, uh, post-presentation and before our, our uh, questions here. Um, Brian is the technical manager for Clarion in North America, in case you, you didn't gather that already. Um, he's in functional minerals involved with oleochemical applications for over 25 years. He's a degree in chemistry from Indiana University. Before Clariant, he spent his career at the Dallas Group in uh, Dieselite Minerals. He's given numerous lectures regarding filtration and absorption during industry events like AOCS, Eurofeed Lipid, and other industrial short courses. Now we'll go into uh, a couple questions here. Uh, Brian, what are the oil losses associated with the clay filter cake, and why should uh, BD and RD producers choose ABE versus other synthetic adsorbents? So typically with uh, bleaching clays, it's about uh, 25 to 40% by weight of the clay is going to be the oil retention inside. And that's going to depend on a lot, a lot of factors. The, the main factor that's going to depend on is the porosity of the particles. And with our products, uh, the way they're produced, we're able to control that porosity to we, we have a, a large porosity which decreases the amount of oil retention. So it's more on the line of the 25 to 30% uh, by weight of the, the clay being used. And what was the second part of that question? Why should uh, producers choose ABE versus other synthetic adsorbents? So uh, there's a lot of factors that go into looking at the overall quality of the oil going into the process. So number one, you want to concentrate on products that work, that you know work, and they've been used for many years uh, to remove the phosphorus and metals from the oils. And then you also want to take a look at the total cost of ownership. So uh, if you're looking at a synthetic product, you're going to have a significantly higher cost associated with that. And those products typically won't filter as well and have a little bit higher oil retention. So when you put all those pieces together, the activated bleaching earth is a, uh, a much lower total cost of ownership for the process. Okay. Could you comment on the parameters influencing expected useful life and disposal of the product? So the the useful life of the clays. So I mean, the, basically what, what we're talking about there is the higher the higher the amount of contaminants you have, 
in the raw material or the feedstock coming in, the more adsorbent it's going to require. Uh, typically, you can see up to a few hundred parts per million of phosphorus coming in, but a lot of that's removed during the acid water degumming process. And so you're, you're, you're left after that process with something around 15 to 30 parts per million phosphorus. And that's gonna take about a half to 1% by weight of bleaching clay to remove that phosphorus from the feedstock. Once that clay has been used, it has to be, it, it's, all, it's a one-time use. Uh, it's, it, you can't really reuse it. Once it's uh, absorbed what it's going to absorb, you can't really get any more activity out of it. So disposal is something we're always looking at. Uh, with renewable diesel, it's a bit difficult because of the feedstocks we're dealing with, animal fats and yellow grease, used cooking oils. Whereas with edible oils, some of that feed, some of that uh, filter cake can be actually added to animal feed. That's not the case for the renewable di diesel industry. So it's something that we we're aware of and we're, we're looking at ways to uh, mitigate the, the losses associated with having to dispose that material. So renewable diesel versus biodiesel is a, is a good lead in here on average, how much more uh, adsorbent is used in renewable diesel than in biodiesel? It's pr it's pretty close to to being equivalent. Again, that's going to depend on the feedstock. If you're if you're a biodiesel producer that crushes your own soybean oil seed, then typically you're going to to process that oil anyway uh, with a bleaching clay to remove the phosphorus and the chlorophyll, which is not important for that process, but those contaminants are typically removed prior to going into the process. But if you're a renewable diesel processor that is purchasing yellow grease or a used cooking oil or an animal fat, then you have to make sure you have that pretreatment process in place for your, for your setup, for your renewable diesel plant. Okay. What is the typical loss of oil to the bleaching clay and what happens to leftover bleaching clay? Uh, that's what we just talked about. Uh, the typical losses are about 20, that 25 to 40 percent range. And again, for the renewable diesel, just because of the nature of the feedstocks, uh, the filter cake, the spent filter cake is being landfilled right now. Uh, but that's something that we are actively looking at different ways to, to mitigate those losses associated with that. Okay. Do any metals leach out of the clay? Mm -hmm. There's no metals that are going to leach out of the clay. Um, it's it's processed in a way to where those uh, it's acid activated, but the acid is washed back out. And the only purpose of the acid is really to increase the surface area and increase the ability to actually remove the metals from the, the feedstock. Okay. And it looks like a last question. How does high FFA in the feedstock affect the absorption capacity of ABE? That's not going to have an effect on the absorption capacity. Uh, we're talking about metal removal. The activated clays typically are not going to remove FFA anyway. So that is uh, not going to interfere with the other contaminants that need to be removed. OK. Looks like that is all our questions. Thanks a lot, Brian, for your presentation. Uh, very interesting, appreciate it. All right, thank you, Ryan. And we are back with our, our fifth presenter. Our fifth presenter is uh, Jeffrey Sanders. Jeffrey is with Schrodinger. Jeffrey is the scientific lead 
for the consumer packaged goods division and has been with the company for eight years. He received his Bachelor of Science in Applied Physics from Worcester Polytechnic Institute and his PhD in Biophysics and Molecular Pharmacology from Thomas Jefferson Medical College. Now Jeffrey's gonna talk about uh, exploring the structure function relationships of protein-based surfacants for food emulsions and foams. Thanks, Ryan, and, and thanks everybody for um, attending. So I know this talk might be slightly uh, different than the previous ones, and, and hopefully, you know, uh, it's interesting to at least a, a few people who are understanding how, you know, uh, molecular-based simulation can be applied um, to not just what I'm going to talk about, which are protein-based emulsions, but um, also a lot of other different types of, you know, oils, uh, condensed phase systems, um, we can do a lot. And so just to, you know, if you're unfamiliar with Schrodinger, we've been around for about 30 years now, um, we focused uh, a lot on uh, life science and materials uh, discovery, so new material discovery. And, you know, our purpose here really is to improve human health and the quality of life by transforming the way materials, therapeutics, um, and, you know, new chemistries are designed and discovered. And you know how we do this is through simulation, and and many of you maybe feel maybe are familiar with multi physics simulation or FEA simulations. We're on the exact opposite end of the scale, so we're talking about things on the molecular scale. I'll give you a sense of you know size and length scales, but we're using physics based simulation much like other computational methods are, and we do this through a variety of applications. Um, some for drug design, some for therapeutic design, but also primarily material science. And so if you've ever interacted with protein crystal structures or small molecule crystal structures, you ever had to make a, a graphic or opened a scientific journal um, and seen a bunch of really nice molecular structures, they were probably made with Pymol. Um, and so we are the commercial um, maintainer of Pymol. Um, it's freely available for academics still. And we tie all of this together either through a, a core modeling suite or an informatics platform if you're trying to democratize simulation out to a, a larger organization. And I know that all sounds, you know, very, you know, physics based. Okay, but what are you actually doing? And, and you know, what are you simulating? So um, when we think about, you know, the challenges with multi-scale modeling, right? And this is a, you know, cross science and engineering problem is really marrying the scales between very low level simulations, maybe high level of theory um, up to something that is a whole part, a whole vehicle or a whole product at the end of the day. And that could be almost anything really. And so where we, you know, exist and where our tools really focus are on the, you know, the electronic and the atomistic time and length scales. So in those cases for electronics, we're usually looking at a single molecule or a periodic structure that's crystalline. And we're using density functional theory. We're using plain wave periodic DFT um, to describe the electronic properties and you get a lot of interesting things out of their uh, UV vis, IR, uh, and a lot of other um, you know, relevant properties like redox potentials in this case or bond association energies, especially for lipids, which are super important. And then when you move up to classical base simulation, we talk to atomistic, we're thinking of molecular mechanics, MD, um, we're really using you know, physics-based simulation to describe you know, using Newton's laws of motion, how atoms behave, you know, in a liquid phase and a solid phase, and that can, you know, interfacial systems, uh, you know, any sort of combination where we can describe the chemistry very well, um, we can model it. And then ultimately, you know, you want to take that information and put it into something that's much larger, like a mesoscale simulation, whether using Monte Carlo methods or coarse grain, you know, molecular dynamic simulations. And, you know, if you simulate big enough, the idea is, is that you could take the output of that and use that as something like a representative volume element in a continuum mechanics simulation. So, you know, while this is great, this is still a very difficult problem to think about, you know, just overall um, trying to use pieces of information from each time and length scale and add them to the next higher one. So ultimately, electronic properties could one day use to be feed into a continuum model um, that could perfectly describe the electronics all the way up to a whole part or a whole product. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're as a community and, and as a company, we're focusing very hard on trying to make this, you know, something that's approachable and not just something hand wavy that, you know, someone might talk about and then it only works on one particular case. 
And, you know, I, I like to, you know, orient um, when I'm talking about, you know, smaller length and time scales, uh, since this is much smaller than people are maybe are used to dealing with, especially on the manufacturing side. Um, when we think about, you know, what, what can we simulate? What can we look at, uh, you know, at the nanometer scale or maybe the, you know, the 10 nanometer scale? We're really talking about looking at surfactant um, condensed phase systems. We're looking at, you know, maybe micelles, uh, bilayers. Um, aggregations, whether it's small molecule, large molecule, polymer, protein, and really what we're able to simulate are things up to like actual micelles that you can validate using something like dynamic light scattering um, or some other experimental method for critical micelle concentration, a whole host of properties that could go on for an hour about. Um, but the idea is, is that we're really looking at either the interfacial properties of emulsions or foams or we're looking at very small, maybe nano emulsions. And that's really where, you know, we shine and the tools work very well. And just, you know, again, to you know, understand the differences here, since I think it's important, since all this is based on chemistry and, uh, you know, something that I think we don't emphasize enough and always comes up in questions after these talks is what are the parameters that you use to fill your simulation? How do you set it up? We don't use experimental information per se. Um, we're not, you know, using a bunch of ODEs. We're not inputting kinetic rates. We're really just using quantum mechanical properties with condensed phase experiments for Van der Waals uh, estimations of atoms. And that's all we're doing. So we're letting the chemistry and the physics completely describe uh, the temporal evolution and the electronic properties if we're talking the QM scale. So there's not a lot of input as long as you can describe the chemistry and you know what's in your formulation, what's in your oil, what's in your interfacial system, you can most likely simulate it. And depending on how long it takes for an interesting property to evolve, maybe, uh, you know, self-assembly or you might have transport properties, those are usually something you can either do a simulation or you can use different techniques to answer those questions. And so since I'm going to be talking mainly about molecular dynamic simulations, um, you know, the one thing that's very important uh, is a force field, right? So understanding the chemistry, as I mentioned from the QM level, force fields are a combination of QM calculations to describe partial charges and, and bonds and all of that fun stuff. But really what we're doing at the end of the day is we're just solving Newton's second law. And we're describing the temporal evolution of all of the atoms in the system and how they be, you know, behave under certain environmental conditions, whether it's changes in temperature, pressure, or changes to pH of the system. So, you know, laying the foundation um, for how we would use the simulation, it, it's, you know, in the past 10 years with the advances in computational power, so GPU computing is, is very popular besides just Bitcoin um, mining for everything else. Um, you know, we leverage those to run physics-based simulations at speeds that we would never have been able to do 10, 15 years ago. And so what that means is that we can start looking at properties like self-assembly for something like an emulsion foam. And this is just a simple example, you know, illustrating right at the macroscopic scale, everyone's seen what whipped cream looks like. If you go down to the microscopic scale and you start to look at the emulsion properties, right? So, you know, how do my cells form or if there's an air gap because it's a foam, you know, what does it look like on the micron scale? And then what does it look like at the molecular scale? And so, you know, thinking about we can't simulate all of this, but we can start feeding in molecular pieces using physics-based simulation, and that can help understand the microscopic properties at the end of the day. And since, you know, this is just focusing on a protein surfactant, you know, we can also simulate traditional surfactants. Um, we thought this is interesting because this is something that as uh, food and beverage, uh, cosmetics, and all these industries focus more and more on natural ingredients, um, understanding where it's come, you know, proteins are becoming more and more um, a health, you know, uh, choice or something, you know, for an alternative meat or something that you can add to your product that is, you know, naturally made, quote unquote. And so there's a, a well-studied fungal protein. They're called hydrophobins. Um, they're made in filamentous fungi. Uh, they are highly amphiphilic, so they have very good surfactant-like properties. They're excellent candidates as emulsifiers, anti-wetting, surface coatings, and also for tons of biomedical applications. So understanding how these proteins self-assemble, how they form interfaces um, between air or hydrophobic and hydrophilic solvents, um, is really important. And so if we can simulate these and start to understand the mechanisms, that can give us some really useful information if we want to try and develop more complex formulations or we want to add them to an existing product. 
And so, you know, the, the, the assembly or the stoichiometry of, of how these work is you have a single molecule and at an air water interface, uh, the way that the protein folds is that it has a very hydrophobic patch that will orient itself along uh, either a hydrophobic solvent interface or air um, and the hydrophilic just stays in solvent. If it is in a full solvent phase, not in a foam, it will display different properties depending on the solvent conditions and environmental conditions. You can have just a single protein molecule form, dimers, tetramers. Um, it can form a polymer, either a nanotube or a fiber, depending on the solvent conditions. And this has you know, been studied academically for years um, and is illustrated by the fact that if you crystallize the protein under different solvent conditions, it will form different asymmetric units of different space groups. And, you know, the most well understood one, which is HFB2, hydrophobin 2, has a really nice asymmetric unit tetramer in the crystal structure um, for one solvent condition. But if you swap that out later, you can still get an octameric assembly that looks more like a polymer nanotube. And so really controlling solvent conditions is going to be very important for how these things assemble, but also when you start adding in either co-emulsifiers or if you need to add in other solvents, preservatives, what does that do? How does that change the stoichiometry and how does it drive these proteins to form one type of assembly versus another? And so you know, one tool that we use, and this is, this is for applications of fermentation where we're trying to understand um, how a protein might behave when scaling up, when processing at large scale. So does the protein aggregate and, you know, how do we minimize that? So we can use structure-based tools and this is, this is physics-based because we're looking really at the electrostatic surface and the partial charges along the surface of a protein to understand, you know, what portions of the protein are charged. And in certain cases, as I mentioned, fermentation and others, we're trying to understand how to control that because maybe we care about aggregation. Um, in this case for hydrophobins, we want controlled aggregation in a very specific manner. Um, or in cases where you need soluble protein for some application, you don't want it to aggregate. And so we, uh, Schrodinger published a paper, I think 2018, a few years ago, um, in a collaboration with BMS where we looked at, you know, if we make changes to protein sequences to make them more or less hydrophobic, how does that control um, overall solubility after you make it in a, in a bioreactor? And so this tool was able to properly predict based upon the, the aggregation score or ag score, as we call it, um, how well something will aggregate or where, you know, what part of the protein surface is actually driving aggregation. So we can apply this um, to hydrophobins. So this is just using, you know, uh, one hydrophobin structure, illustrating that, you know, there are, the scores correlate very well with where the patches are. So that little red patch on the bottom is actually the part of the protein that orients itself onto the air uh, interface, or if there's a hydrophobic solvent. Um, so that's really nice, you know, outside of crystal structures, this is, you know, pretty much well understood, but confirming that the technique actually works appropriately. And we can further break down, you know, these scores to look at on a per sequence basis, you know, what's the hydrophobic contribution, what patches of the protein um, are contributing more or orient are going to more likely orient along that interface. And why this is important is you may not want to engineer these proteins, although people have gone to some lengths to add other structural elements to them. Uh, you might want to select which protein in particular you want to use. So maybe you're using a different class, you're picking it from a different organism, and you want to understand, you know, what's the, the relative size of the molecule. Maybe you have another lipid that you want to interact and you want to know where is it going to interact? Is it going to disrupt um, fibril formation, polymer formation, or, you know, aggregation and self-assembly along an interface or, you know, solvents or an emulsion at the end of the day. So what this does is allows us to break down on a, you know, sequence specific manner, it, what the ag scores are, what the hydrophobic contributions are, and that allows us to make selections. So there's maybe 15, I think now, crystal structures known for di different hydrophobins, mutants, different, you know, organisms, um, and being able to understand, identify which ones have high aggregation scores might be a better selection candidate for a particular type of application. 
So, you know, using a simple screening technique um, like Ag Score, something that takes about two minutes to run, um, we can get some very useful information about these proteins and maybe use this as a, you know, as a core selection guide or criteria. But if we really want to understand, you know, how does aggregation play out in, in different conditions, we really have to start looking at, you know, simulating these things in solvent. So we can take the simplest one, we can look at, you know, um, hydrophobin two, we can look at a tetramer, we know what the crystal structure looks like, we can pop it in water, we can run the simulation for 200 nanoseconds, we could run it for longer, this is just, you know, the shortest amount of time to get some interesting behavior. What we see is that if we start with monodispersed protein in water, um, it very quickly aggregates. It does form an assembly that's slightly different um, from the crystal structure, which makes sense because the crystal structure solution was, I, I don't remember the exact um, details, but it was not water. There's usually a lot more in there. Usually there's PEG, there's other um, excipients or co-solvents. And, you know, it actually starts to form a prefibrable. So even though we're only explicitly simulating four molecules, we're actually, you know, can look at in space, does it align and it starts to align in somewhat of a protofibril um, manner, which is really interesting because, you know, that's something that's been suggested by the scheme of how these things self-assemble, but never observed explicitly, at least not outside of one single small angle x-ray scattering paper. Um, we can further take that and we can look at an interface. So does it assemble the same way that it would in water? We don't expect so because now those hydrophobic patches on the bottom don't need to bury themselves against each other or, you know, try to, to reduce the solvent exposed surface area. Here we can actually see that if we put something up against like a, a you know, um, a very hydrophobic solvent against a water interface that they will align as we'd expect, but they're going to align very differently. They're more spread out. It's more like a linear polymer in that case, even though they're not covalently attached. And so that's, you know, really nice because while these are simple systems and while, you know, it's, it's somewhat expected based upon aggregation scores and what's been seen experimentally, um, this allows you to start expanding, maybe swapping out solvents, maybe adding co-emulsifiers, changing the temperature, heating things up. These are all done at you know, room temp, these simulations, but you could easily heat them up, cool them down. You could add uh, an air gap in there, a vacuum gap, so that you can look and see how does this assembly change on an air interface versus a hydrophobic, hydrophilic solvent interface. And you can start to add more and more molecules. So, right, so, you know, since we can run these simulations for a long period of time or we can run larger and larger systems, we can keep adding more molecules. We can look at, you know, properties like RG, something you could use to validate experimentally. You know, are we getting the right size, maybe either for an aggregation of the protein emulsifier alone, or if it is an emulsion and you have an oil in there, can you get the RG right? Usually, at least for nano emulsions, we can do this reasonably well. Uh, and then you can start thinking about, you know, adding more and more complex formulations. And so in this case, we're going to a coarse grain timescale um, and we're moving up to much larger simulations. We're adding in a co-emulsifier and, you know, running these for even a microsecond, we start to see that this things assemble. Um, we don't see the, the standard less than only behavior. We do see it almost forms a, a bicontinuous emulsion um, with just two components, which is really interesting. There's more work to do in this realm, uh, especially with these simulations, run them for longer, um, change the, the various compositions. But what it shows us is that, you know, just by changing simple things like solvent or adding a co-emulsifier, we can start to predict different types of assembly properties, which gives a very um, deep understanding of what's happening in your system. It may not be the same as running it as a reactor scale or at the manufacturing scale, but if you're trying to rationalize a behavior that you don't understand, either during pilot phase or production phase, or you're trying to make changes, these simulations can be used to either lower the costs by reducing the number of experiments you need to run, or in the case where some of the, you know, very high res techniques don't have the resolution to rationalize why you're seeing a certain behavior. Simulation usually adds uh, that extra level of insight um, without having to, you know, try a lot of really expensive experiments or make, you know, new formulations that may or may not be easy at the end of the day. And so that's that's all I have. I'm happy to take questions. Um, this is a you know a newer project. It's evolving. We've done this with tons of other surfactants. We have a lot of other applications. Um, more than happy to talk offline about. Uh, but you know this is just interesting because it's moving towards you know as 
as the food and beverage industry and cosmetic industry, especially want more and more natural ingredients and, and people are looking towards alternative sources for emulsifiers, uh, these protein applications are becoming more and more interesting. And so we're going to see more and more of it as time goes. And so uh, having a very good understanding of how they behave at a very small molecular scale can help really drive decisions or new product development at a much larger scale for everyone else. And so that's it. All right, and we're back, Jeffrey. Thanks for that. Uh, definitely a different a different look at things. Uh, could could you share a little bit? And, and you touched on it right at the end as you were winding down. Um, so sort of where have we been five or ten years ago? Um, that kind of took us on the road here, and then and then maybe in, in another five to ten years, um, where will where will your market be? It's right. So good question. So ten years ago, the way either the, the theory or the computational power, those simulations, the idea of even running a microsecond, which I, for a lot of people on this call, I'm sure seems insanely short. Um, that was just not feasible. You ran a 20 second nano simulation. You really had to have your system assembled the right way. So if you had an emulsion, it had to be as a micelle or you were never gonna sim simulate that assembly. So you know, now that we can start to touch on these things, I think that you know, 10 years from now, following closely to Moore's law, you'd expect that we should be able to simulate emulsion foams or get very close to that. And the physics should be even better. So if there are small tweaks that we have to make now to a specific emulsifier or a specific emulsion to get the right experimental properties to match, uh, we'll probably have much better force fields too down the road where you know it'll just work for almost any realistic chemistry that one might want to use. So bigger and longer, I guess, would be the, the, the easy way to answer that. Great, great. A question um, from, from the group. What is the molecular weight limit of a protein for the simulations? So there's no molecular weight limit. Usually you can predict anything. So there are some proteins where they don't exist uh, as a monomer. Um, they exist they exist either as a fibril or some, you know, amorphous aggregation. There's no real limit. It's just when you get above maybe 20 nanometers, which is usually even dystrophin, I think you can fit in there, which is one of the largest proteins in the genome. Uh, you could probably do all of them. It just depends on whether you need to add 10 or 20 of them to get a realistic assembly for the property you're interested in. That's all the questions we have. Uh, Jeffrey will be back later for our uh, roundtable Q&A. Thanks, Jeffrey.
Okay, our last presenter in this session, but certainly not least, is Mary Landis, uh, Industrial Sales Manager from uh, FOSS North America. Mary uh, has uh, 15 years experience. Uh, she's, um, her current areas of responsibility are food, feed, grain, and the oils industry. She has a degree in chemistry from the University of Missouri, Kansas City. And again, over 15 years of experience in these industries, working for various companies, selling all types of analytical instrumentation. So with that, um, she's gonna be presenting on uh, quality control of edible oils with advanced NIR technology. So Mary, all yours. All right, thank you, Ryan. So yeah, as Ryan said, um, my name is Mary Landis and I work for FOSS North America um, in the oils, grain, forage, and uh, feed industries. So I'll be talking today about these specific topics, specifically in regard to the DS2500L for use with oil products. I'd like to start by giving you a bit of history about Foss. Niels Foss began his company in 1956. His vision was to take time-consuming, complicated methods of analysis and manufacture instruments that could be used by anyone. He grew this company into a worldwide entity that has become the dominant player in the food and agricultural industries with regards to analytical instrumentation. FOSS was founded on three core principles of being the first in innovation, being customer centric and retaining its people and knowledge. From the inception of our company, our core values have not changed. The oil industry is a great example of how we're pioneering the way for new analytical tools to meet the industry needs. These are the core technologies FOSS is heavily involved in. I'll be speaking today about NIR and chemometrics in more depth. In order to get the most out of this session, I think it's necessary to take a step back and walk through the fundamentals of NIR. We'll talk about how NIR is used in analytics, how calibrations are built, and our application notes. So this is some of the background on the FOSS NIR instrumentation. The NIR system too was referred to as the 5000 and the 6500, and they were the absolute workhorses for academic purposes in the 90s and early 2000s. In 2005, FOSS developed the InfraExact, which had a redesign for an environment with a lot of moisture, dust, and heavy vibration. It was also redesigned to be used by plant operators in industry with little to no laboratory experience. However, with this redesign, the wavelength accuracy and precision was sacrificed. But remember, the goal was to withstand harsher environments, which we did accomplish. We then came out with the XDS, which was designed to produce the best optical signal to noise ratio over the 400 to 2500 nanometer wavelength region, which was to be used in a clean research environment. Once accomplished, FOSS set out to make an instrument that matched the optical capabilities of the XCS, but could also be easily used in the plant environment. And that was the birth of the DS2500. In 2020, the DS2500L was released for use in the oil industry to measure liquid samples. So essentially what FOSS did was combine the best of our previous instruments. The industry has become standardized on 400 to 2,500 nanometers because most people use the nearest 5,000 and 6,500 platform in their research papers. And this is why FOSS continues to use these specific wavelengths. So I'm gonna focus on three major trends in the oil industry environment that FOSS has identified. First being the increased sensitivity of specific parameters for materials and products. Second is the inline process control. And thirdly, the digitalization of the food production environment. So this slide shows various points in the manufacturing process as points of use for our instruments to provide rapid analysis of key parameters in oil production, which gives you the power to make timely informed decisions. Areas of production that can make use of NIR are the following. In raw material receiving, it allows you to check incoming ingredients to make real-time formulations. In process, it ensures product quality and allows for making production changes on the fly if necessary. 
and also at the finished goods point. And this ensures products are meeting specifications. So near infrared analysis is actually quite simple. Essentially what we're doing is shining wavelengths of light at a product. Based on the composition of that product, specific wavelengths will be absorbed or reflected due to the vibrations of molecules. We collect that information about which wavelengths are being absorbed or reflected using a detector. That information is then correlated to the results from the primary method of analysis. We then create a calibration database for the composition of the product to be predicted. So I'd like to discuss a little bit about accuracy versus precision. The NIR is highly precise. AOAC approved primary methods are accurate and precise if performed correctly. The accuracy of NIR comes from the primary reference method being used. So the general rule is that the FOSS NIR will be within 1.5 to two times the error of the reference method. The absorbance bands observed in the near infrared region arise mainly from vibrations of molecules that have covalent bonds with hydrogen atoms, such as with fat, moisture, and protein. With the new technology we've come out with, it's opened up areas that allows for measurement of additional parameters that are more challenging and have lower concentration ranges. So the concept behind building a calibration is to first scan the sample on the instrument giving us a spectra. Then we send that exact same sample to the lab for chemical analysis, which is used as reference data. Finally, we correlate the sample spectra to the reference data. That gives us one data point for the calibration. We'll do that exact same thing over the range of target results to create your calibration model. So I know there's a lot on this slide, but I feel it's important to walk through the major components of our NIR instruments. There are different characteristics that make up each particular wavelength. As we get closer to 2,500 nanometers, there's a much better signal to noise ratio. However, we do lose some of the sample penetration depth than what occurs at 400 nanometers. For this reason, we're very selective about which wavelengths we pick for measurements because each wavelength gives unique information about the compound being analyzed. Overtones are characteristics of specific molecules, and that's why it's important to look at the entire spectrum. Types of measurements that we offer are transition, reflectance, and transflectance. Transmission is the ability to look through the sample for less homogeneous products. Reflectance has the penetration depth, but provides information about more parameters of your product. And transflectance is a hybrid of the two. It provides increased sensitivity of reflectance while looking through the oil sample and allows for various path lengths of light to be used. The DS2500L uses transmission where we've combined most of the visible region along with the NIR region into one solution with the ability to measure from 400 to 2,500 nanometers. FOSS implements the use of various types of regression methods. ANN or artificial neural networks deals with nonlinear correlations or large concentration ranges. We've seen that, that as the concentration range increases, the instrument response is not always linear. PLS, or the partial least square, can deal with linear correlations. And we've seen that our PLS regression method works very well in oil data sets, since we're typically looking at smaller concentration ranges. So FOSS has taken the initiative to create calibrations for oil products. These calibrations can be slightly modified if needed to be more specific to your product. We publish our FOSS calibrations in what we call application notes. The application notes are key in providing result expectations in sample preparation information, such as the type of vial being used. N is the number of samples used to create the calibration. For this calibration on FFA, we've used 2,156 samples, or that's 2,156 data points within a specified range. We also provide the mean reference value in the calibration set, along with the minimum and maximum reference values. The application notes also contain a section showing the validation performance. 
Here we use additional samples to validate the calibrations we've created. In this validation set, we used a total of 670 samples. We show that the linear correlation, which is expressed as the R squared value or RSQ for FFA is to be 0.96. And R squared equaling one means you have a perfect correlation. The accuracy of the DS2500L, which is expressed as the standard error of prediction for FFA is 0.15. This means that out of those 670 samples that were sent to the lab, we found the error only to be 0.15%. Now keep in mind that we're looking at many different products and also remember that the NIR is one and a half to two times the error of the primary method. The graph shows the predicted measurements as blue dots on the line for the reference data. You can also see that with the iodine value, oleic acid and linoleic acid value, we have an R squared of 0.99, meaning that the correlation is extremely good. Now this is purely an example of what FOSS has created. Where we have really had the most success is in collaboration with individual customers to build specific calibrations for their manufactured products. And this is an area where we would be happy to explore with you at a later time. So the solution in short is that the DS2500L provides results that you can rely on while measuring multiple parameters simultaneously in less than a minute with minimal sample preparation. It's based on a tried and true platform of the DS2500 and allows for temperature control and color measurement. So different samples may require specific vials and cuvettes for measurements and we've produced different sizes and materials for sample presentation to the NIR. Our application notes detail the type of container used for analysis. And here are some examples of ISI scan. It's a FOSS developed user interface software where you have the information about the particular products you're running. The first window I'm showing is the results view. The measurement results of one sample appears under this view. It includes column headers, which show the name of the primary and secondary parameters of the selected product. You can also view various statistics and outliers. Next, we have our history tab showing a list of sample results belonging to the sample product. Measurement results are then displayed against the corresponding parameters in the data view. Here we have the graph option, which includes a main graph and a number of thumbnail graphs in the data view. In the details section, the user is presented with four tabbed windows of information, information, results, spectrum, and audit trail. You can add qualitative information to characterize your product in this section, such as color, supplier, or whatever you can think of since it contains user-defined fields. And then there's the care option. And this is where the user's main interaction is with our dashboard. It provides the user with options to run diagnostics, calibrate instruments, and synchronize instruments, and even request remote support directly from the FOSS application support team. We've made our software very user-friendly. People can typically be trained on it in 30 minutes, and it's geared towards operators that aren't very familiar with NIR or using computers. We've created the software with easy click-throughs, big icons, and obvious notifications for our outliers. As you can see, we've also embedded our own SPC charts. So when you do have an outlier, it pops up right away and it's very obvious. Another trend in the industry we've seen is the need for inline analysis. So we've created the ProFOS too. We currently have the ability for tracking processes for the meal where manufacturers are looking for the proper amount of extraction to take place. We don't currently have calibrations created for oils with this solution, but we're exploring ways to get there with our division in Spain. We expect to have a solution for the US available in the next three to four years. Currently, the major parameters of concern with the meal is fat, protein, and fatty acids with soybean and canola meal processors. The red dots here indicate the grab samples and the blue line shows the trending inline analysis. They're quite closely matched where the blue line indicates 
that it can follow the production changes very similar to the benchtop instrument. And then the last trend that we've noticed in the industry is the digitalization of the food production environment for data collection for incoming materials, process control, production, and finished products. Both benchtop and inline instruments have the ability to utilize our digital services. And this allows you to back up your data, monitor your instruments remotely, and receive updates. FOSS offers various tiers of digitalization. Proprietary software allows users at technician level to the administrative level where you can oversee everything about the samples and products being run. We have the services in place today to support the networking of instruments and of all the cumulative data being collected. Collecting the data now is going to put you in a very advantageous position in the future. And that is all I have. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mary, for the presentation. Interesting look at um, some analysis uh, that can be done. Uh, one question for you. You touched a little on uh, the data that's generated. Um, is that cloud-based or where, where is the data stored or what are the options there? Yeah, so we actually have three different ways that you can do that. Um, there's a cloud-based and then we also can let um, individual manufacturers have their own if they wanted to. And then we also have a shared storage as well. Okay. What are some other areas that your company is utilizing in IR technology? Oh my gosh. Um, so 80% of the world's grain right now is traded and analyzed using FOSS instruments. We also have 85% um, in the dairy industry using FOSS instruments, both benchtop and online. Um, it's pretty much anything agricultural that you can think of where we are a major player. Great, great. Let's see any other questions? No other questions. All right, thanks, Mary. Okay, thank you. All right, we are back for our uh, roundtable Q&A, and we had a couple of specific questions uh, come in sort of at the end of, of the individual presentations, and we're going to jump on those first. The first question is for Brian Cook. What are the safety aspects of handling ABE disposal and the self-ignition risks, and how are these mitigated? So the self-heating of the, of the product, that's, that's due because you have high heat. You have a product with a lot of surface area and you have the feedstock on there, which is a fuel source. So if the conditions are correct, it will start to uh, self-heat and smolder. Uh, the best thing you can do is reduce the heat, use nitrogen to blow down the filter instead of air. And once that filter cake has been discharged, spray it with a little bit of water and that helps prevent the surface from interacting with the air uh, to produce that heat that comes off. Okay. 
Next question is for Mary. Mary, do the online systems fit into the existing process automation controllers like PI and LIMS? Yes, absolutely. Um, so we've been able to do that where you can actually have a feedback loop attached and do automatic adjustments, say for dryers um, and that kind of thing. But yeah, absolutely. Okay. Does FOSS have robust measurement techniques and calibrations for phytic acid and ingrain? Ooh, that one I'm going to have to throw to you, John. There, there are some capabilities uh, of NIR that sometimes uh, kind of uh, approach the, the limitations of the technology. So, so I, I'm not familiar of anyone actually having phytic acid calibrations. But if there's a good, robust um, uh, chemical analysis method um, and the range is appropriate, then we could always build uh, calibrations with customers. So I would say that uh, as long as we, we have the ability to, to analyze the product, we should be able to make some predictions on that. But I don't know of any customer right now that is actually doing that. Okay. All right. Just... Uh delaying for a moment here, see if anything uh, pops in. Uh, having not seen anything, uh, I'm going to go around the room a little bit uh, for some closing remarks or anything anyone wants to clarify. And I'll just start in my little Zoom screen here. I'll start with Brian Cook. Brian, anything you'd like to add or summarize? Sure. Just to summarize, um, it's very important to have the pretreatment process for the renewable diesel process. Uh, the, the phosphorus and metals can really uh, decrease the life of the catalyst. You spend a lot of money on that catalyst. It's very expensive, and it's also very ex expensive and time-consuming to change that catalyst out. So preventing those contaminants from entering into the reaction is, is critical for the, the process. Um, on the biodiesel side, same thing really applies, that phosphorus really decreases the efficiency of the reaction. So in order to have the reaction go as it needs to go and to completion, that phosphorus needs to be removed as well. The uh, filterability is another important aspect. So you wanna make sure that you have a product that's very porous. You're gonna have high flow rate. That does a couple of things. Number one, it decreases or it increases the amount of time that the filter's online. So it increases your throughput and it also decreases the, the time and cost of cleaning out the, the filter to get rid of the filter cake. So those right. are really the main uh, points I wanted to emphasize on that. All right. Thanks, Brian. And Mary, you. Well, I think the major take home is that we're constantly developing new calibrations and working with customers and customizing and creating new things. So just because we don't have a calibration that's already made doesn't mean that we can't do that, that we can't partner with somebody to help them find um, the parameters and, and the measurements that they need. I think you have some good customization abilities there. Definitely. I think that that's one of our strong points. Okay. And Wei, it is your turn. Thank you. Um, so in my presentation, I talked, uh, I focused mainly on using the MISA uh, as an analysis tool for edible oils, but um, it is a, a very generic tool for trace, con uh, trace contaminant detection. So it's applicable to a lot of different food types, uh, different types of sample matrices. So for listeners out there who are interested in different types of applications, please feel free to contact us to, to find out what it's able to do, whether it can solve your needs or not. Um, we do a lot of application development using this instrument, uh, catering to different types of applications. All right, thanks, Wei. And Doug? Sure. 
I just want to stress how important it is to take care of the rolls in your flaking mill um, to, to properly relieve the ends um, in a timely manner so you don't further develop uh, more problems in the future that could take a lot of time to correct. All right, good summary. And last but not least, uh, Gabriel. Yes, I think the, the, the key learning of, uh, of my presentation is that we, we are uh, developing a bio-based and clean alternative to exane in, uh, in oil extraction that is safe for consumers, for workers, um, for the environment. Uh, it's a huge work to do, of course. And so we are now very close to the market. Um, the, the technology is, um, you know, uh, the scale up is uh, is advanced, so we we look forward to partnering with uh, oil seeds crushing companies, uh, engineering companies, to uh, to further develop our our new innovation. So feel free to to reach out after um, after AOCO's meeting. All right. Well, thanks Gabriel, and thanks everyone. This industry update we we certainly hit a a lot of different topics and a lot of different areas um, uh, for, for processing. So thanks everyone for your presentations. Uh, thanks to all the uh, attendees, the viewers uh, for their time and patience. Appreciate it. And with that, we'll close out. Thank you.